Now, the story of a star's life is in many ways the story of an extended battle between two opposing forces, gravity and the pressure, as we have discussed, maybe not in too much detail so far. And uh, as uh, we will see, life as a low mass star is actually pretty different from life as a high mass star. What do we mean by low mass and high mass star? First of all, remember, the star, the, um, the mass of a star is what determines its core pressure and temperature. And those are important because it's going to determine its fusion rate. Hydrogen fusion. As hydrogen goes to helium and as we will see later on, when helium forms in the core, will fuse into carbon and so on, if there is enough pressure and temperature. And so remember that HR diagram? So we have luminosity here, and actually temperature goes this way, okay, increases this way, so we have hot here, colder, they're never too cold, those stars. And remember that main sequence, okay, and this is where the stars live, and we have the high mass stars, they're more luminous, and then we have the low mass stars, somewhere here are actually the brown dwarfs, which are the failed stars, and somewhere here, the intermediate stars, the low mass stars. Okay, so here's how we usually divide these things. Because, you know, the, the mass is going to determine what's happening with them. Um, so what do we have? We have really high mass stars, so... are the ones that have masses that are at least eight times the mass of the sun. And then there are the low mass stars, the ones that have less than two times the mass of the sun. Here would be the intermediate mass stars. And, you know, their evolution is going to be somewhere in between that of low mass stars and high mass stars. But we are going to talk about the low mass stars right now and in the next um, video lecture about what happens to the high mass stars. So let's start. So while that star, the low mass star, life of a low mass star, okay? After the main sequence, what's happening after the main sequence? Hydrogen in the core is depleted, converted. To helium. Okay, so here is the main sequence star and here is after there is no more hydrogen in the core. What's gonna happen? The star becomes larger and redder and more luminous and this is going to be 
this situation. Why is it? So because the helium core grows in mass, right? So this is going to be the helium core right here, okay? And it's going to crush down thanks to gravity, of course. The hydrogen is going to live in a shell and it says burning because it's still hot enough hydrogen goes into helium so it is the nuclear fusion reaction or burning that's what we mean by that okay and so this is pulled in by the gravity of the helium core and so it's going to burn even more vigorously and that's why the luminosity will increase and that's mainly because the core thermostat is broken there is no uh, fusion actually happening in the very core so it's nothing to keep up with the crush of the uh, gravity all right so we have an inert as we call it inert helium core here. Well, that core stay inert until the temperature becomes not 108 but 10 to the 8 kelvins. That's 100 million kelvin. Okay, that's only that's the, the moment when helium is able to fuse into the next heavier element which is the carbon, okay? And that fusion process of helium into carbon, it's called the triple alpha reaction because uh, it does take three helium nuclei to make one nucleus of carbon. And even though we don't, we're not gonna go into the details of how exactly that reaction happens, it's important to note that the fusion of two helium nuclei actually doesn't work. And so, yeah, it needs three. But now, remember, there are nuclei here. So those are charges, right? And charges that have the same sign, they repel one another, okay? So these are electrostatic forces. So we need something stronger and that's going to be, you know, that strong nuclear force to overcome these electrostatic forces. But that only happens when the nuclei are very close by. And that's only happening when the temperatures are even higher than it used to be in order to uh, produce the helium out of hydrogen by fusion. So, yeah, larger charges now, because we have helium nuclei, leads to greater repulsion, and so we need higher pressure and temperatures for the triple alpha reaction to happen. So basically this reaction is just not going to happen immediately. It's going to take quite a lot of um, formation of helium in the core and uh, until it's not enough for the gravity to create those really high temperatures and pressure, this helium is not going to fuse into carbon. But it is going to happen. In helium, it is, is going to ignite in the core, all right? But that's going to happen really fast. That fusion rate is going to skyrocket, and that is going to uh, uh, create an immense thermal pressure that takes over the star and is going to expand the core again, and the star becomes again a red giant. Actually, 
an even larger giant. So it's going to be a super giant. Or it was just a subgiant before and now it's a giant. So now it's a very, very giant giant. All right. So what do we have here? Now helium is fusing um, into carbon in the core and hydrogen continues to fuse into helium. So here we have hydrogen that goes into helium and in the core we have helium or three times that go into carbon, right? And remember, we actually need four atoms or nuclei of hydrogen that are going to create the helium. And that's going to happen in the shell, okay? So when that happens, that ignition of the helium, helium into carbon, that happens quickly. And that moment is called the helium flush. What's going to happen there? The temperature rises rapidly and you have the, that double burning um, situation. However, overall, it's going to be less power because the thermostat is working now. So you have gravity pushing in, but now you have plenty of power, radiation power, that's moving out. So we have radiation that's coming from the core and the shell, and then we have gravity pushing in. Let's clean up a little bit here. There you go. Okay, so thermostat is not broken anymore. And so now the star will kind of um, live in a, um, will, will go, goes back to lower luminosity for a while. How it looks like on the HR diagram or the, the truck after the helium flash. So remember, this was the main sequence sun, and it becomes the sub giant where you have hydrogen burning in the shell, and then you have an inert helium core. It's going to be the helium flash right here. So helium starts burning into carbon. But after that, it's going to be the so-called horizontal branch. So the luminosity goes down a little bit and it it gets hot actually enough because you end up having helium burning in the core plus hydrogen burning in the shell. And compare with real data for a star cluster and you see all these stages. This is a cluster for which we catch stars just like our own. You see this main sequence turning, turn off point, and we have lots of subgiants and red giants and stars nearly ready for the helium flash and then the helium burning stars on the horizontal branch. So real data actually matches really well with what we uh, what we see, um, what, what the models tell us. So, uh, of course, there is some uncertainty uh, as to exactly where the horizontal branch is and the exact location actually is going to depend on how much mass is actually lost when the star was a red giant because uh, that phase also comes with some winds that it's going to uh, take away some of the material that the uh, from the surface of the of this um, star. 
Okay, next. Here's what happens next. The helium is burning in a core, but at some point the core is going to be completely converted into carbon. So we end up with an inert carbon core, and then we have hydrogen and helium burning in a double shell, right? So you end up with a lot of carbon and then a shell of helium still burning into carbon and then another shell of hydrogen that goes into helium, so burning or fusing, okay? Okay, all right, so uh, that means what's gonna happen here, there are no more photons created here. There is no radiation, that carbon is inert, it was just formed there. And so that means that whole star will contract and it's going to, the core is going to contract and heat and the helium ignites in a shell, in a core, and the hydrogen burns in a shell outside the shell of the helium. And things are going to happen, so the, the photons are created in the shell. Two shells here. The photons or the radiation pressure. What do you think is going to happen? There is a lot of pressure here and that means the star becomes even larger and more luminous. The so star becomes again a giant as we mentioned before. So on the HR diagram, so we have luminosity, temperature, this was the main sequence, so we had the star, the sun, it went first, it became a subgiant, it was the helium flash, it went back to become uh, on that horizontal branch, and now, now becomes this super giant, an even greater giant, okay? So this is what happens now, and this is the asymptotic giant branch right here, right? So what do we have here? We have double shell burning stage. So actually, this will never reach equilibrium because in that inert core, right? Inert, and it's going to be very hard to uh, have carbon fuse into nitrogen or oxygen or heavier and heavier elements. It's very hard, okay? Even though it tries and it's gonna end up showing some pulses, you know, it's trying, and uh, uh, what happens, we have some convection dredges, that uh, convection that dredges the carbon up, so we're gonna have some convection cells is going to dredge the carbon up from the core to the surface so it's basically not going to allow that carbon to to fuse and therefore produce energy or radiation pressure in the core itself those are going to be the thermal pulses right here so it's going to look like the star swallows it's going to become more luminous but then you know, short time after that is going to kind of collapse and become um, smaller and so on. And those pulses are actually going to disturb this star completely or almost completed. The star is going to, it's going to become so-called planetary nebula. And that's a misnomer. It doesn't have anything to do with planet.
but at the very beginning, when these things were observed in a sky, they looked like there was a star in the center, which it is. It's just not a living star. It is whatever was left behind from this explosion. So it looked like there is a star in the middle, in the center, that is surrounded by a disk of material. And people initially thought, astronomers initially thought, this is where the planets form. But it's not. This is actually at the very end of the life of a star like our own. And this is just expelled gases when the star explodes. Explodes, or actually it's one of those pulses that is going to disrupt that star. It's one of those pulses that is going to end up in an explosion. That particular explosion, that phase, is called the planetary nebula. Okay, what's left behind? That is going to be a white dwarf, so basically a carbon star. It's a bunch of carbon. It's a bunch of carbon that initially is very hot, but there's going to be no fusion. So it's just going to cool down. Do you know the name of the carbon that is very cold? Okay, cool down. And then in many, many, many hundreds and billions of years, that is going to look like a diamond. So the white dwarfs are the diamonds in the sky. Here are some examples of these explosions that we call planetary nebulae. They make for some of the most beautiful images out there, especially when we have a high resolution telescope like the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. Images of planetary Nebulae. Nebulae, that's the plural from the nebula, right? We don't call them nebulas. Okay, uh, in case you wonder, this phase, the planetary nebula phase, this planetary nebula phase, lasts very short compared to the rest of the life or everything else that the star goes through. So that's very that's a very short time. That's about 10,000 years before actually dispersing into the interstellar medium. So if you basically come back 10,000 or so years after we observe a planetary nebula, you look around, you're not going to see much because all that gas, all those shells of gas have been dispersed into the medium in between stars, the interstellar medium. Remember we talked about that. So that's about the last hour in their life if you were to compress or all their life into a, the human lifetime. Okay, so as we said, the hot core simply cools to become a white dwarf star. And it's a star in a sense that it's a point source of light, but it's basically the remnant of what was a star some time ago, right? So there is no more fusion. The fusion process could not happen, it's not going to happen anymore, there is uh, nothing to make the pressure, the temperature inside that white dwarf thing hot enough to have that carbon fuse into heavier and heavier. So here's a summary of what happens to a star like ours. So here is burning hydrogen burning in the core until there is no more hydrogen in the core and so you end up with the inert helium and this is the track. The star becomes a subgiant because of the hydrogen burning shell that is going to um, expand the outer layers of the star. And that's going to happen until there is enough pressure and temperature 
that the helium will start burning and so you end up on this situation or along this um, sequence with helium burning in the core and the hydrogen burning in the shell. Now the helium is going to burn in the core until you end up with no more helium in the core. All that helium is converted into carbon. The carbon is inert, doesn't have the power of fusing anymore. So that inert carbon core will be surrounded by two burning shells. One is going to be helium that will keep adding basically carbon, inert carbon to the core and another shell above the helium shell, helium burning shell is going to be the hydrogen burning shell, the hydrogen that goes into helium. So again, adding more helium to the interior shell of helium, right? So the, here's the, the face, the, the, the red giant now is the, the giant face of that solar, uh, one solar mass star where you have the double shell burning red giants, nothing that creates pressure in the core basically. And even though the core starts, attempts to ignite that carbon, that's not going to happen. And we have those pulses. One of those pulses is going to be deadly for the star and that's going to create that planetary nebula phase so the explosion, you have ejected the outer layers of the star in the interstellar medium and the luminosity of whatever is left over, the remnant, the white dwarf in the very core, which is basically just carbon, almost inert, will, the luminosity will go down and the thing is going to cool, so it moves along this line with time in the HR diagram. So that is about it. Now let's talk about how all these transformations for a star like our own sun have to do with the Earth's fate. So here's a diagram that shows the luminosity of the star, a star like our own, from the very beginning, so that's zero, that's the birth time, right? So the star was a proto, that's our sun was a proto star at this time, and it lives for, you see, about 10 billion years. And the luminosity doesn't, doesn't change much, it's pretty constant, right? It does rise a little bit, so the sun does become a little hotter every billion of years if you want okay and at some point there is no more hydrogen in the core right again we're reviewing everything so you're gonna have hydrogen burning in the shell and you have a helium inert core until we have the helium flash. And note how the luminosity, when that thing happened, is at least a thousand times its current level. So when when the, the our sun is going to go through its own helium flash phase, it's going to be a thousand times more luminous than it is today. That is definitely going to be too hot for life to actually survive on the surface of the Earth. Okay, so it's after the helium flash, the, the, even though the, the star is going to decrease in luminosity and then becomes again the giant, okay? Um, so here was the subgiant. So that was the giant, the luminosity is going to increase, then there are the thermal pulses and eventually the planetary nebula ejection, one of those pulses, the deadly one, is going to create that ejection of gases that we see as planetary nebula, and then immediately transition whatever is left over from this star is going to be the white dwarf. Even the white dwarf itself is going to be 
at least a hundred times more luminous than the sun it is today. So, yeah, we need to enjoy it only for the next, uh, that sun, only for the next five more billion years. That's it. That's how much we have on the surface of the Earth. Let's look now uh, at Earth's fate from a different perspective. Now we're going to look at the size of the star. Right? So we have the radius. Of course, it's one here. So that's one solar radius. This is where it is now. So it's kind of um, swelling up a little bit, but just barely. Okay, so by the end of its living stages, right, so this is the main sequence times, again, about 10 billions of years, it leaves the main sequence, and this is why the time the helium flash happens is pretty much the size of the Earth's orbit, right, that is the, uh, between subgiant, so we have sub giant, and then giant phase here. By the time the planetary nebula happen, it's still pretty pretty big, that star, with the thermal pulses. By the time uh, the, we are able, for example, to see from afar, obviously, hopefully, uh, whatever was left from that star, that would be the white dwarf, that is pretty small, and that is almost the size of the Earth. We're going to talk some more about white dwarfs in, uh, in the next chapter.